like a lot of people, we believe that real estate and particularly single family homes are an ideal investment for the small investor. It's something we can control, but we wanted to do something different. And we're gonna share a little bit about a personal experience we had that made Frank and I decide not only were we going to do a single family home for disadvantaged people, we were gonna turn the industry for recovery homes upside down. And along the way, we found that this was a purpose-driven investment, a purpose-driven investment that helped other people, but we found that we had extraordinary cash returns. We built a substantial appreciating real estate portfolio in an overheated Seattle market. And it's been overheated for years. We started in 2015. We buy homes every year. And those homes have doubled in value, but even more has been the value that we have given to so many hundreds of people with our homes. We have a saying, invest, get a return, but serve and make a difference. So we're the founders of Kate's House Foundation, and we'll briefly give you the story, but we found that you can use a 501c3 and a for-profit real estate investment and get grants and change people's lives. We're gonna show you how that can work for you. You know, by education and training, I'm actually uh, a PhD in medicine from University of Washington Medical School. And I always say life has a sense of humor. While I was in grad school, I was doing research on drugs of abuse, particularly opioids and how to stop them. Little did I know that that research was going to follow me the rest of my life. You know, I flipped out of academia into biotechnology and I've worked in several biotech companies, but the role I'm proudest of is being co-founder with Frank of Kate's House Foundation. And me, I spent 34 years in international luxury branding. It was very exciting, very sexy, fashion shows in China and business in Europe, all over the world. That was exciting. <clears throat> but uh, prior to that, I had my own company. And I don't know if anybody knows what pickleball is, but at, back in the 90s, my company made the world's best pickleball paddle. And I was interviewed on numerous shows about that. But what I'm most proud of in my entire life has been co-founder with Sherry on Kate's House Foundation as we wake up every day to grateful people. We've been sharing our message for many years. We've actually taught thousands of people throughout the country to do what we do. But we're asking people to join us to invest in real estate, but to end housing insecurity. We know that millions of people are on the edge right now. And we're going to talk about how you can get involved in your community. And once we got started, we started getting a lot of attention. I mean, big attention. Mm -hmm. We've had powerful senators send their staff to our houses to take a tour and say, what is this miracle that's working? You know, the government is really intrigued on solving housing insecurity, but they don't know how to do it. It's really up to the private sector, to us, those of us who own single family homes or rental homes, to create a solution. And Frank and I created the solution. We like to say the private sector is making the difference in America's biggest problem. We moved to Florida recently to open up homes down here. In fact, we had only been in Florida for a month when an entire county north of where we moved contacted us telling us that they had been following Case House Foundation in Seattle for many years. And they want to know if we would bring our solution of single family homes to their county and help them end housing insecurity. They had us meet in front of 64 organizations all wanting to use our shared housing model to end homelessness. What was really amazing, all of those organizations had funds to pay for room fees. In fact, one of our students who's housing veterans here in Florida connected Frank and me up with Marco Rubio's office. And it was great because it was a veterans organization and it was the staff that supported veterans for uh, Senator Rubio. But they asked, they said, if you could do anything in the world, if you had to ask her the federal government, what would that be? And I said, what we'd like to see is that nationally, fair housing laws allow our type of shared housing in every neighborhood that we deem is an appropriate neighborhood for shared housing. You know, the government is starting to listen to what we are doing and how we're solving problems. This governor, mm -hmm. Governor Jay Inslee, listened to. You know, we'll share with you how we deemed Washington State to be substandard in shared housing and how we got legislation passed that unless homes in Washington state are accredited to our level of housing, they can't get federal funds. 
that's a <clears throat> huge opportunity for us investors mm -hmm. because the bar is low and when we create housing that meet the national standards and we get all those government contracts and our success rate is way higher than everyone else's guess what people are banging on our door to pay us for the bed per bed huge contracts we developed our first shared home in fact we used a roth ira to partner to uh, with funding to create our first shared home thank you dennis blitz you showed us how to do that and we provided housing for eight women and these weren't just any women these were mothers who had been incarcerated because they had drug addiction we know today and i knew when i was in grad school that addiction is a treatable disease but in so much of the country when people fail with addiction or mental health issues they're incarcerated so we took these women in and we brought in eight women and within six months we had three very expensive homes and then 24 women and before we knew it we had designed a program where people could live in community we are getting government vouchers we purchased one single family home that has morphed into many and we've served more than 700 people just in this one city block where we have housing we Let's just say we morphed, as all our students do, from in, uh, real estate investors to housing providers. That's what we are. We're housing providers, and we get government funds to fill those houses. So what is shared housing? People always ask us, what is shared housing? They have this mindset <laughs> of when they were in college, you know, shared housing wasn't always very neat and clean. Uh, they have questions about uh, sober housing or recovery housing because a lot of times those aren't in the best of neighborhoods. But we have a different vision of shared housing. We created the vision. We created the roadmap. You know, we go back to 1975 and the Oxford housing model rents homes from landlords. But one of the things we found out, we found out from personal experience with my daughter, Kate, is that in Oxford housing, Residents are voted in and out of the house by other residents. Extremely punitive. And there was a rigid structure created by Oxford. There had to be because in an Oxford housing model, the rules were set nationally by the organization. And this has worked for a lot of people, but the one thing that did not work for my daughter and doesn't work for many people we've learned over the years is that with any problem, whether you failed to do your chores whether you relapse, because that does happen with substance use disorder, you're out on the street in 15 minutes. Resulting in homelessness for another six months. And sometimes we found, because we interview all the people personally to this day who live in our homes, that people were incarcerated after being kicked out of Oxford housing. A lot of times people have great intentions, but when they lose their housing, they have nowhere to go. So we created a model we call the shared housing model. And our shared housing model, the Kate's House model, we've used all over the country. Um, counselors recommend and monitor our uh, clients. So we're working with institutions, hospitals, drug courts, uh, agencies that monitor foster kids. We're working with penal institutions. We're working with the women's shelter. We're working with people who can provide support. We're not social workers. We're the people who are smart enough to buy the real estate. We enjoy engaging with our residents because they're amazing people who are trying to make life better and they're succeeding so well in our houses, but really we're not obligated to it. We are housing oh. providers. We, are, we provide the house, we set the rules, we make sure the rules are fall, but they all have their own supervision. And their own program. And we only choose people who demonstrate commitment to be a good member of our home. You know, there's a lot of people looking for housing, and there are so many that come to us that are moms and dads trying to get custody of their kids back, trying to reunite with families, they're working, but because of their history, they can't get housing. And we found in the shared housing model, they have housing and they're able to move forward with their lives. And we invest in people, and we have the roadmap for success. Frank and I created it. Uh, we've been sharing this roadmap throughout the country and, and within other states and creating houses in our model everywhere. We learned through a young girl named Kate who was trying to get herself back together that the recovery housing industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. There are billions of dollars out there that, that they were collecting. But the problem is it was like the wild, wild west. Every recovery housing just had its own yeah. thing. And some of them, okay, many of them, okay, most of them, <laughs> 
where it's very substandard. In fact, there are newspaper articles in Seattle Times in August of nine, uh, to a few years ago called Homelessness to Hobble. And it followed a woman who was homeless and they were getting government vouchers <laughs> a mile away from us, you know, of $800 a month per bed. But it was a terrible slum. It was horrible. The, the description was terrible. But we were getting the same taxpayer dollar vouchers by having beautiful homes and safe neighborhoods with gorgeous furniture and high success rates. So we're starting to tip the scale. And, and we call it, it's a business model. It's a business model. And we right now in Seattle, we own and operate six homes. A lot of you may know that we've been national speakers and training people throughout the country to emulate our model. But right now we're getting ready to open 20 more in uh, Florida and more in Washington state. And the price of houses in Florida are half the price in Seattle. We've earned millions of dollars in government contracts since we started in 2015, and we've served over 700 people personally, but the students we've trained have served hundreds of people. But what we all have found is that we're getting tremendous cash flow too, so we can expand the business. We achieve tremendous cash flow. Now, so let's talk about a typical single family rental versus the shared housing business model. You know, we know that the typical average net rent on a single family rental, when you think about it, across America, this is an average, it's $1,700 a month. It's twice that on the coast, it's half that in the middle of the country. But when we take out expenses, this number of 200 a month on average is what people receive. And that is if you don't have anything break down or if you don't have somebody who squats in the house. But we want to share with you, this is the climax of the presentation, the shared housing roll, solutions please. business model. And we really want you to pay attention to this. What we do is we get a four bedroom home or five or five or a three bedroom home with a big family room that we can cordon off and we put in two beds per bedroom. But what we know, because we have been dealing with government agencies, as the government will pay us for each bed. So here's your home. And what we're talking about here is 6,000 a month or 7,000 a month with $2,000 of expenses, which includes utilities. So you're getting 4,000 a month. I mean, this is tremendous. You can have $200 a month for a single family rental and deal with eviction moratoriums or you can have a program, a program where you're putting eight people in a home that are specifically hand-picked from an agency who's going to ensure their success. We call this tremendous cash flow. It changes everything when it comes to investing in real estate. It's not the old-fashioned mm -hmm. way where you're trying to eke out and buy cheap so you can get a few more pennies. This is tremendous cash flow that enables us to keep our houses running, everything proper, beautiful, everything working now here we are we, we speak to a lot of groups you know we were in front of a real estate investment group in seattle washington this summer which is our hometown and we said we can do better we believe the business sector people who know real estate can do better we can run this like a business we were particularly proud of this uh, the real estate guys uh, interviewed us, and I think it's been one of the most popular broadcasts I understand this fall. Um, if you want more information, go ahead and pull your cell phones out. <clears throat> this was a recent interview with Kevin Bupp on scaling sober living homes. And so I, I guess we've hit the national stage because it's a cool idea. This was our first home. This is the one that we purchased and rehab completely, and we financed it with our Roth IRA courtesy of assistance from the IRA club. Thank you team. That was in 2015. In fact, we're going to show you the numbers. We went in at $400,000. That seemed like a big amount of money, back, of money then. back then. From the day we housed our first resident, we've had nine women in that home at an average monthly rent paid first by an agency and then by the women themselves at $800 a month. That house today is worth in the mid $700,000 if you're into appreciation, which we are. When we look at all of the expenses, our profit each month is $4,500 a month. I just can't understand why someone would want to buy a beautiful single family home and put a husband, wife, two kids, and a dog in it. I, I when don't we get bought, it as an investment. When we bought model. this home, 
in 2015, the average rent was $1,600, which was the cost of our, our mortgage. So we jumped right into this by creating the roadmap. It's Kate's house number two, that was a foreclosure we picked up right down the street. These homes have been servicing people every month for six years. And here's our business model here. It was, we were 440,000 all in. And we're getting $850 a month, each month on a government contract, whether the beds are filled or not. So there's a kerching in the beginning of the month on our checking account. And when we take away all our expenses and our utilities, it's $5,000 a month, $60,000 each year potential income. So each of these homes, they've pretty much paid for themselves in the last five years. And we'll continue on. And so Kate's House 3 and 4, we bought these homes adjacent to each other. They're currently housing 16 men between both homes. Some of them are 75-year-old Vietnam vets. That's how old the Vietnam vets are now. You know, we discovered a secret here and we wanted to share it with you. We want to let you know that we not only buy homes because we like it, but since we teach that you can lease a home and have the same business model, you know, with a mm -hmm. low move-in fee, it's tremendous. So we ended up calling up a landlord and we'll tell you later how we easily convinced her to share her house with us, give us a lease. And within yeah. within a week, <laughs> we that, had it filled. $2,200 a month, we had the house filled with nine gentlemen at $850 a bed. And we just bought this one in the beginning of the pandemic and it, we found out that's a good time to buy a home because we had two agencies fighting with us to fill our home. It's got a beautiful view of Puget Sound, great investment. And what we found is when you have the real estate, you can you can be of service to people. I wanna share our story though. You know, we keep talking about Kate and my story started in 2000 in Moscow, Russia. My older kids convinced us to be a host home for this little girl when she was six. And, you know, like any host home, the idea of, of bringing these kids over was, would you adopt this child? Well, in spite of her history of trauma and living in an orphanage and addicted parents, absolutely adopted this child, <laughs> only to find out that she experienced addiction and homelessness and shame and ended up under bridges repeatedly. And folks, we share this with you because this is where our kids, our parents, our grandchildren go when they feel they failed you. And they don't have a safe home to go to. This is Kate on heroin and actually the gentleman I'm with in this picture, I was taking the picture, was my son's best friend. He did not want me rescuing Kate at 23 from the heroin den, so he went with me. But the reason Kate failed for eight years is she ended up in those Oxford type homes where she was put out and she would end up under a bridge. So we said, we can do better. We can do better. And I wanna show you what happened when we finally found a home where they allowed Kate to stay. Same child three weeks later, clear eyed. I'm the mom who's smiling for the first time in eight years. You know, you can feel the pain of your children when they're suffering, even if they're not with you. And Kate ended up getting married, having a little boy. She's very cognizant that addiction and trauma are run in her family. And she does not want that to happen to her son. So we can do better. When we're talking about shared housing, you may say, you know, with Sherry and Frank, recovery housing may not be something I want to do, but veterans homes, we house vets. This is reentry from prison. These are our These actual are ladies. ladies. You know, they were, one of them was a kindergarten teacher. Uh, student housing, a lot of students during the pandemic Mom and dad didn't want them home. They wanted to live near campus. They couldn't even be on campus. This is one of our recovery homes and notice our people. Typical, amazing, amazing women who all, by the way, succeeded extremely well. And the one second from the left, she's making $40 an hour, downtown Seattle, working on building cranes. Yes. She's doing very well. Foster kids aging out of the system. This is huge. We have so many of them. People on fixed income, temporary workers, uh, we have students who got out of the recovery home business to house traveling nurses. They're making a lot of money with that and helping in corporate housing. Really, it's anybody you want. This is sweeping the nation right now. We are experts in national standards 
for recovery homes. It was founded in 2011. Not only did NAR create the national standards, Frank and I created them for Washington State. And they standardized the ethics in the industry. So when people work with us to provide housing, we're working under a banner of NAR. In fact, you can see here in America, when we first saw this and started teaching this in 2015, the green states are in our states, the blue ones are emerging states, only a handful of states were NAR, uh, required NAR certification, which are a set of standards on how this house is administered. Now it's the entire country. Um, we're gonna talk about medically assisted treatment homes. That's what we do. I've got that specialization in medicine. And what that means is that we know that the disease of mental health or addiction are solved by appropriate medication, but most shared homes do not allow people to take medication. Doesn't make sense to me, but NAR set a, a set of standards so that can happen. And state laws now are requiring MAT in accredited homes. We just saw that's most of the country. It's required to get government funding. We're experts on this. In fact, we just signed another $400,000 a year contract with one agency to hold beds open, whether they're filled or not. We were the first four certified homes in Washington state. Those certifications not only attract agencies that just wanna throw money at us, but the nice thing about it too is when you're a level two recovery home, landlord tenant relationships do not apply. In other words, the fee paid for someone to stay in our house is for a clean and sober environment. Therefore, we don't know what squatters are. We just applied for $75,000 a year grants to be used for mortgage payments if we'll open a new home. But I wanna point out though, we rarely look for grants because our cash flow is so tremendous, but this opportunity on this grant is like, okay, we'll go ahead and- Well, we're the only ones who are eligible for it, so we figure we're gonna get it. <laughs> we know everything you need to know to find the perfect house that's gonna serve the population that you house well. And this is your top 10 list. We've actually got about 25 or 30. Frank helps people all over the country pick out homes via satellite. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Dennis and Remen. We're so grateful. Thanks, we are. Dennis. So long. The information contained herein is intended to help the viewer successfully navigate common IRS and Department of Labor requirements to help achieve successful results from their IRA. The information is not intended to replace information from your legal counsel or income tax professional. IRA Club does not offer or sell any investment. All investments have risk.